Hello, welcome to the first of our CSS Winter of Discontent with these new posters, uh, Alliance and New Labour, Lessons and Legacy. If you're not already on our mailing list, it's just around the corner, there's a bit of paperwork around there. Um, if you pop your name and a contact method, email really, on there, we'll um, keep you up to date with all the rest of the events we've got going for the next uh, four months. There are many. Uh, and as always, thank you to Space Academy for hosting us. Um, but a little bit of background about the talk this evening. Uh, the setting is from the 1984 election, the New Zealand Labour Party uh, defeated the electoral machine back in the day of first past the post, and uh, the National Party and Prime Minister Robert Muldoon in the general election. This was the fourth Labour government, and they pursued a path of market liberalisation and deregulation that abandoned all of the orthodoxy of the social democratic politics of the Labour Party and began the destruction of the labour movement itself, the welfare state, and the post-war compromise between interventionist or Keynesian economics and capitalism. Uh, one MP from the Labour Party split over this and formed New Labour. Tonight, our two speakers, both members of the Socialist Society, uh, who were there at the time and joined New Labour. Our format will be that I will hand over to our speakers uh, for some introductory remarks and also probably a little bit of history, brief, brief history. Uh, and then I've got a few questions for them. We'll have a quick break and then reconvene for any further questions or comments from the floor. And so I will hand over to Paul Pierce and Quentin Findlay to introduce themselves, uh, some of the background and provide their version of the decision to leave Labour and join a new party. I'll let you fight amongst yourselves who goes first. Some of you probably microphone. Some of you probably will have received this delay do from Tom, which uh, has a range of questions down there, and I'll endeavour to respond to some, but not all of them, because some of them are specific. Like number three to me, uh, which says. Very erudite this. Paul, your background comes more through Trotskyist and Marxist organisations. That's my understanding. What was your thinking and others like you uh, that led to you becoming a, a sort of democratic socialist or social democrat electoral party member? Um, there are various answers to that. One of them is loneliness. There was nowhere else to go at the time. Um, I had done time in a sect, which at its peak, at about the membership that we currently now have, that's to say, uh, Centurions. Um, we had a weekly newspaper, and we had uh, uh, a full-time caterer of about half a dozen, living on the smell of an oily rag, of course. And the membership was punished, paid heavy dues, went to meetings every bloody day of the week, it seemed, and consequently got burnt out. It also fell prey to the very common disease of the far left, and that is it fell under the sway of a bigger party overseas. In this case, it was the Socialist Workers Party in the United States. Consequently, both of them descended into being sects and nothing more. So that behind me, and having been in the Labour Party since the age of 15, in it, but not of it, if you like, um, there was nowhere else to go. Consequently, when Jim Anderton led the charge to leave it for good and proper reasons, together with, I suspect, the bulk of the active membership of the Labour Party, we all decamped and joined the NLP. And there might be others here today, apart from us two, who were part of that movement. To be fair to Anderton, and I'm not always, he, um, he said, that he didn't want to be a one-man independent MP. 
he wanted to build an alternative Labour Party. So he had all sorts of arguments about the name and the symbolism and all that stuff. Also, to be fair to him, he endeavoured, despite his natural instincts, to be collegial and to operate in a team kind of environment. That was not his natural inclination. With Anderton, it was my way or the highway, basically. And he had that in a struggle, I think, um, and lost. Uh, consequently, the membership didn't always stay around. There were some big strategic errors. At first, we had our opening meeting, I think it was a big ball in Wellington called the Oaksies Visitors Lounge, where the cruise boats used to park. And it was full. It was chocker. Queen's Wharf, that there. Yeah. Um, and what a motley crew we were. Mostly left Social Democrats, people who couldn't abide Roger the Rat and all the scabbery that uh, uh, that Labour government had imposed upon us. But also uh, the triers, you might say. There was a well, there's one young lad who stood up, and I don't disagree with uh, his position necessarily, but this is not the place where you stood up to the microphone and proudly announced to the media and the world, I am a communist! You know, as though, you know, we should genuflect, maybe. It went down like a bucket full of coal. Uh, yeah. So we had that lot to deal with. And subsequently, a bloke called Bill Logan, with his Spartacus League in Wellington, decided to adopt a policy called entryism. In other words, you go into an organisation in order to recruit from it and raid its membership. So we had a National Council meeting to get rid of this bloke, and he brought his troops in, and we were all sitting around the table, and he had his troops all standing behind us, breathing heavy. You know, it didn't work. He went. He's still alive, old Bill. So it was fun. But it didn't work. There were lessons to be learned from it, however, um, and some quite serious lessons. First of all, it proved that you can build something outside the Labour Party. It is possible. You need the right confluence of events and circumstances. The next lesson is that given the attitude of most of the New Zealand public that politics consists in parliamentary elections, electoralism, and nothing else, uh, you needed to have some focus in that direction, and that's where Anderton came in. Uh, and it's also a media focus. Don't think for a moment that that was the only focus. There was a, a common saying amongst the rank and file, quite widespread, that we wanted to build what we laughingly called the Parliament of the Streets. In other words, uh, you weren't just interested in bumping people into Parliament on Election Day, uh, but in building mass pressure amongst the public on the streets. Those were important lessons. Um, so there's a need for leadership. There's a need for some kind of electoral focus, not just nationally, but locally as well. Um, and that it's possible to do that outside the Labour Party. There's always been an argument in the left about the Labour Party. It's, Martin will tell you, it's rife in Britain as well. Do you work within the Labour Party to try and convert it back to what it ought to be? Or do you leave it and try and destroy it? And that argument is unresolved. The latest eruption in Britain, of course, when the, the left had some success in electing a leader and he got undermined and booted out to Mr. Corbyn. In fact, I think he's expelled or suspended or something. Um, yep. So that's what happened to Anderton. He got kicked out, but he went happily and he built something. The next big mistake that they made, in my view, uh, driven by the ambition to win in a parliamentary sense, was to develop the alliance. The NLP was people who came out of the far left and the Labour Party. The alliance was an agreement foisted on us really by Anderton with a motley crew including the social credit political league, 
Uh, uh, yes, a couple of cast off National Party uh, MPs uh, who formed the Liberal Party and consisted of them and their spouses, I think. Um, that's the Liberals. Uh, oh, yes. And of course, the bloody Greens. Oh, yeah, Matt Rogers, Mun Matahaka, yeah. Um, they were okay. But the Greens used the alliance to get their foot in the parliamentary door and they left. Um, and you've seen their chequered history since. Uh, what else can I tell you? Well, any notes here? Yeah, it's only about me, it doesn't matter. Alright? Your turn. I'll just take the, the segue to share a story that Tom told me to tell and, and you chuckled at earlier anyway, um, because it, it dovetails quite nicely anyway, uh, that what I remember of this era uh, as I, I was a child, uh, that uh, Rod Donald of mm -hmm. Alliance at the time came around to our parents' house and asked, could I put an Alliance billboard up in the paddock? And Dad said, yep, no problem. Um, next election rolled around and he came and said, could I put a Greens billboard up in the paddock? And Dad said, is it a problem if I keep using Roundup on the property? He said, nope. <laughs> and so for the next couple of elections, we had Green billboards up in the paddock. Um, but that, that's, that's the extent of my memory. <laughs> Uh, but I'll hand over to Quentin. Um, yeah, thanks for having me here tonight. Now, Paul, if I understand it, Paul's, we got the sorts of questions, and Tom initially asked me to sort of do what a full five minutes of introduction about how I ended up in the NLP and the Alliance, and I did drag my old NLP badge and so on out of the garage from where I actually had it, so um, this is one of the few badges and so on that we had. Um, I joined the Labour Party as actually a 14 and a half year old um, in 1982. My father was the branch secretary or one of the secretaries um, on the executive committee of the National Union of Railway Men. There were no railway women at that point, but they were in the cafeteria and so on. But um, basically in Timaru and Ash, Ash Britain, and so of course I joined the Labour Party and so on because of the fact that one, of my background, and also two, it was um, at that point led by a guy called Bill Rowling. And um, of course, Bill, if you're looking up, was actually a social democrat. He believed in, you know, essentially free education, free healthcare, regulated economies, progressive taxes and stuff like that. And so as a young 14, 15 year old and so on, 15 and a half year old, I went and campaigned for Labour in 1984. And that was when the rot set in, and I think Paul did the same thing. And basically we ended up with a government that we never really voted for, and um, doing policy, well we did vote for it, but doing policies that we certainly didn't actually ever vote for. Um, lots of corporatisation, lots of privatisation, lots of deregulation. Um, and essentially in Labour Party members were just told and so on at the time, well you know, you need to let us do this because Labour's only been in once before every time or twice before and it's only been three years and we need to get the stuff done and then after that of course after we get the hard stuff done then it'll be the land of plenty for everyone and essentially the next term we can divvy up all the wealth. That never really happened, um, you know, and by the time the next term came around in 87 the Labour Party was in complete and absolute disarray. I remember attending a few Labour Party conferences and so on where people screamed and yelled and so on at each other. Branch meetings and so on. I remember one branch meeting where people threatened uh, people and so on with uh, basically fisticuffs and stuff like that. So it was a wonderful family sort of atmosphere that didn't exist and so on in the Labour Party at the time. I, as a young person, of course, I joined Labour Youth, which at the time we discovered was also controlled by the right um, and so of course we mobilised ourselves because we became identified with the left. The left was basically anyone who believed in social democracy and more left wing and essentially believed in Labour Party philosophy and original uh, policies and we rolled them. I remember going to a Labour Party um, what was it, economic policy network meeting which um, you know, essentially because Jim had started organising these meetings to talk about alternatives to neoclassicalism. 
And I remember standing there and so on and addressing this and talking to this trade unionist I was sitting next to, or oh, sorry, standing next to, and said, well, you know, do you think I should go and talk to Jim and offer my help? And this guy said, well, you know, I don't fucking know. Why don't you just do that? Now, I've never actually, thank you for that, Paul. You know, I've never really forgotten that. But, you know, it was a, a great welcome. But having said that, you know, it was one of those things that, you know, essentially that you just really had to, to muck and, and do what you need to do. As Paul said, you know, the entire situation became just increasingly... Um, Terrible, and I suppose. Uh, well, Tom has asked, you know, was there any way, shape, or form, and so on, that you could have remained in the Labour Party? And this has been asked to me too by other people as well, and essentially just won it over in 1990 after they lost. And the answer to that is simply no. There was no way on earth you could do it because essentially you had the left of the Labour Party, which was us. You had the right of the Labour Party, which became ACT. And then you had the centre of the Labour Party, which is now what you've actually got. And essentially, even though the centre would say to you, hey, we really like you guys and we support you, they always fucking voted for the right. <laughs> and so basically, you'd always end up with them saying, oh, well, you know, we're sorry about that, but we had to keep the government and, you know, we need to support our MPs and that's why we decided to vote against you. So... It became that sort of thing. So there wasn't any way on earth and so on that we could have actually stayed in the Labour Party. Um, Jim, at this point, it grew out of the Economic Policy Network and then the Labour Policy Network, uh, decided to form the NLP. Um, he left, and essentially in April, actually, I think, um, April the 24th or something like that, in 1989, and... Yeah, and I think it was late April, and he decided to actually leave, and it was a bit of a rush affair because he'd been up and down the country talking about this, and then one of the people who was very loyal to uh, the Labour Party parliamentarians basically spilled the beans and so on, she went to a meeting, so the entire thing was rushed up. And so he left, and my little footnote to history is that I was the first senior Labour Party member um, as president of Labour Youth, the lead after Jim. And so then, of course, Paul left, and Chris Trotter, of course, left, and a whole range of people left. And as uh, basically Paul said, probably about two thirds of the activist base actually decamped and, and walked out. So the party was gutted and so on in no time. They basically lost the youth section, they lost the industrial section, they lost a whole lot of sections and so on. So the Labour Party ceased to function. And, of course, it was also going through its own rigmarole as Douglas was fighting with Loggy. The entire caucus and cabinet was breaking down, so it was real chaos. We went and formed the NLP, uh, which, as Paul said, we had the foundation conference at the Queen's Wharf and so on. I remember that. I remember the permanent revolutionary groups screaming, we want to be a communist, and the, what was it? And the news media standing outside giving them fantastic interviews. And we'd gone into that conference on 15% left the conference with 1%, and essentially, you know, it sort, of, it, it sort of joined us my views from that moment on about Trotskyites in any shape, way, or form as a result of that. And I apologise to those of you who might actually be that, but I'm, it, certainly, it certainly cured me of any sort of, um, you know, desire to do that. The new Labour Party, of course, uh, essentially uh, believed in traditional labour values, um, you know, Jim wanted, as um, Paul has said, you know, Jim was naturally an autocrat. What served him well in the first, in that caucus of the Labour Party, is standing up, speaking his mind, not bowing down. And that, that was basically, you know, what he actually did. He was the only MP who actually stood up and said, this is not Labour Party policy. You shouldn't be doing these things. Made him more or less impossible to work with the way we got him into the, into the same party. But at the same time, it's that sort of strength of nature that if he hadn't have had it, the NLP and so on wouldn't have been formed. And hence the alliance wouldn't have been formed. Um, as Paul said, there were plenty of good times. There are plenty of bad times. Um, the alliance, of course, was formed in 92. Again, that was a decision of not only Jim, but also Matt McCartan, the master strategist. Yeah, and um, essentially along the lines of, well, you know, if we got all these other parties in the bed, then, you know, and 
you know, we'd, we'd actually could achieve something. And I am mindful that in the aftermath of what was it, the mother of all budgets, and um, you know, and the Unemployment Contracts Act, because like I said, the NLP had gone down to one percent, but we'd steadily built ourselves up. We won Sydenham back, and Anderton was the first MP to actually resign, stand against his own party, and then win it back. And so we went to 5%, then we went to 7%, then we went to 9%, then we went to 12%. And when, after the Employment Contracts Act was implemented, we were actually on 17%. And when we actually formed the alliance, I remember at one point, I think we were on 32 to 33%. Like, basically, we were just either just behind or just ahead of the National Party and Labour. And because both of them had collapsed completely, people had no uh, confidence in them at all. And I suppose that, you know, to cut it really short and so on about what did the Alliance do, well, one of the few things we did do uh, was basically drag Labour kicking and screaming back to the left because there's no way on earth, up leading up, particularly in 1993, that Labour was a left wing or social democratic party. It just wasn't. So, yeah. Can I add a couple of things? Um, one of the questions here is lessons to be learned. Uh, one of the abiding credits to Anderton is that in line with the NLP policy, he fought for, battled and blackmailed the Labour Party to agree to the establishment of Kiwi Bank. Because we had had publicly owned banks in New Zealand. Um, we had the Post Office Savings Bank, which got flopped off, for example. Um, and we needed a bank. What he didn't take into account, and I'm not sure that any of us did, was that a small, relatively speaking, state-owned bank, in a system dominated by large multinational banks, has to play the same game. So it's not been the great advantage that I think Anderton, in all fairness, expected it to be, and that we did. So that's another lesson that's important. What we're up against is not doing individual things that will solve problems. You're up against an entire system, a network, if you like, a way of thinking, you know, what was it Thatcher said? There is no alternative. And we have to prove to people who largely believe that, that there is, and that the, the kind of politics that we espouse is that alternative. Um, oh, yeah. Social credit, they still exist, incidentally. Yeah, they do. Yeah, um, in a very minor way. Um, and they're a funny lot. Some people think we're a funny lot. Um, <laughs> but if you think we're funny, you ain't seen me <laughs> I am also, just to follow on with that, I mean, I always remember um, my old comrade Charles Picton in the Dunedin North, yeah, yeah. Labour Party saying that, uh, NLP saying that if he'd known that the end result was going to be Kiwi Bank, he would have stayed in bed for nine years. <laughs> but, but, but essentially, we did achieve more than that. And I think it's important to look, you know, uh, essentially beyond that. We did achieve, for example, the fact that Labour flucked around with student loans, in fact, in 1989, what people forget was that Phil Bookoff, who was then Minister of Education, essentially had a report called the, um, good God, the Hawke Report. And it was done, of course, by a business consultant. Um, and essentially, the Hawke Report suggested three things. It suggested student loans, higher fees, and a graduate tax, all of which you've actually got. And basically, Goff, I always remember Goff saying, well, to me, Quentin, well, you know, because I, of course, come fresh from the factory floor at Watties, where I worked for two years, saying, well, you know, Quentin, all the workers on the factory floor wanted, you know, these students to be taught a lesson. And I said, well, it must be a really interesting 10 seconds for you on the factory floor in that case then. And him and I never really got along. But I'm mindful of the fact that essentially <coughs> Labour, even though uh, it said, well, you know, supports free education implement was going to implement large chunks of that report. It was looking at implementing the loans, but it wanted the private banks to do it. And there was no way on earth the private banks were going to sell themselves with student loans. 
So it went for the higher fees, and then Nash left it to National, of course, who actually implements student loans and student fees. And the one thing the Alliance did, again, Labor wasn't very uh, forthcoming about it in 1999, was it chaired the select committee that actually wrote off student loan interest and so on if you were a student, because back then, if you were a student, you paid compounding interest for the moment you actually took a loan. So even when you were studying, they were actually charging you interest, and we wrote that off, we just froze that. And we also, we introduced, you know, we brought back um, Housing New Zealand, which the NADs had privatised and flogged off, and we actually forced Labour to bring that back. And so there were sort of successes and so on like that, and so on that was sort of, but in the end there were other, more things that happened, and of course Tom has mentioned one of them in terms of the Afghanistan war, but there are also issues, of course, with the Alliance, for example, voting against its own policy of free trade zones and um, stuff like that because Jim thought it was a good idea to actually stay in step with the, with the Labour Party and so on. And that, things like that were the ones that really sort of spout the death now, I think, for the Alliance. They were sort of the straws that broke the camel's back. And personal relationships are important too. Jim was always very friendly with Helen Clark. Yeah. Uh, they were quite close mates. And he was probably disappointed that she didn't join him in the Exodus, but there you are. It tells you as much about her as you need to know. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'll jump backwards a little bit just for anyone else who uh, is as ignorant of this history as I was until I did some panic with the pee hearing. Um, <laughs> When, when they refer to, you know, like the right of labour that was at, uh, as I was reading through bits and pieces um, in the past couple of days, uh, like I'd, I'd heard of Roganomics, I was aware that it was this bad thing that got thrown around with neoliberalism, that it was like 80s-ish, um, but, but I had not uh, really got amongst any kind of nuts and bolts. So as I was reading down just a bullet pointed list of like the actual Policies, I, like I just muttered to my flatmate uh, that this is this is just act, and then got further down. I'm like, oh, and then he left and formed act. So literally, <laughs> literally the case. <laughs> um, yes, yep, I caught that. I do have my questions, but why not mix it up? Let's let's. Well, it's, it's not it's not a question. It's just that I'm I'm not sure that everybody in the room is aware of the actual chronology. So you guys are talking about you know. Well, we got Kiwi Bank, but you didn't say that the alliance actually went into government with Labour. Yeah. You spoke about Afghanistan. You didn't say that at the time the alliance was in government. You know, I mean, I mean, some of that. I mean, maybe people do know. No, that. no, you're, you're quite right. I'm sure, there's people and in the room I, don't I, know. I that. think that a, a basic chronology might actually be helpful and so on here for people under the age of. Well, 40. 30, 40. 40, 45, 40, 45. Yeah, 45. <laughs> so essentially, in, uh, in the early 1980s, New Zealand was ruled, that's the only way to say it, by a <laughs> person called Sir Robert Maldoon in the National Party. Piggy! Yeah, and Maldoon had been Prime Minister since 1975 when he'd ousted the Labour government and so on, led by Bill Rowling, uh, who, I, who was the leader of the Labour Party when I joined. Um, and essentially, Rowling uh, led the Labour Party and so on for the 1978 and 81 elections, 75, 78 and 81, and then 78 and 81, Labour actually got more votes than National, but still lost. And the reason that was was because back then we had a wonderful electoral system called First Past the Post. And what it meant was essentially that if you won the seat, then you won government. And so basically it all came down to these targeted seats, electoral seats, so I think there were about 12 of them, that essentially will get all the funding and all the resources, particularly from the National Party, during the election, and they would go to National, and hence National will win. So that went on to about 1984. In 1983, Bill Rowling was rolled by David Longy who was a good comedian, but not a very good party leader. And because of the fact that David Longy had absolutely no idea of how economics worked, absolutely none, he left all the economic thinking to this wonderful guy called Roger Douglas. And then Roger Douglas said, well, I don't really believe in this Keynesian sort of stuff. 
And basically what we're going to do is do the free market stuff, but we're not going to tell anyone on the party this because we had already settled on our manifesto in 1984. So when we went into the 1984 election, Labour was campaigning on things like free healthcare, regulated economies, saving rail, because my father was a railway worker and National had promised to close down basically the rail network and sell bits of it off. And Labour ran a big train headed by Richard Preble called yeah. Save Rail, Vote Labour that went up and down the country basically saying, when our Minister of Railways not one of you will lose your jobs. And the old man said, if we're known then, we know now we'll grab the bloody crowbar around his throat, but that was fine. So come 1984, Labour won the election. Um, then, as I said, all shit broke loose and so on as it unleashed its economic policy. 1987, it uh, won the election again, mainly because of the fact that people didn't, well, working class voters stayed at home and, um, but um, the um, party, Labour Party, nearly won places like Ramuera and stuff like that when all the Tories started voting for, for Labour. Now, in 1989, the new Labour Party was formed. Also, the Greens were formed in 1989, no, 1990. In um, 1990, we stood and so on in Sydenham. The NLP and so on gained Sydenham, as I said. And the Greens got 6% of the vote but got no one. And essentially, Labour got completely trashed. I think there were about 27 MPs left. And National had a 30-seat majority in the House. And that meant that National could do practically anything, and it did, um, basically. Um, as um, some people have said, well, you know, that Labour, um, you know, voting for Labour, Labour would have softened that view, I, I don't really think so and so on. But anyway, 1993, basically what happened was that National got marginally re-elected again. Uh, by this time, of course, we'd also voted for MNP. In 1996, we had the first MNP election, and that was when the Alliance got elected. By that time, we were actually in alliance with the Greens, Manamotahake, the Liberals, and the Democrats and essentially we got elected and so on. But the big victors, of course, were New Zealand First, who came from nowhere and basically won, and then promptly went into a coalition with National. In 1999, the uh, basically National lost, and New Zealand First fell apart completely. Um, and of course, we went into a coalition with Labour. And as a result of that coalition, um, essentially, we largely, or the Parliamentary Alliance, largely went along with whatever Labour's, Labour actually said. I remember there was a big debate and so on in the Alliance about, you know, essentially about the need to actually uh, differentiate ourselves from the Labour Party. And Charles Picton again asked um, Jim, he said, well, how many squabbles do you think we're going to have? How many issues do you think we're going to differentiate ourselves? And Jim said, none. If when I'm leader, none at all. What was it? Uh, one day in government is worth a thousand days in opposition. So I, I think is that the sort of yeah. chronology is that helpful yeah. to uh, people? Yeah. yeah. All of which goes to prove that electoral politics is not enough. I've got one question, just a little bit of context there. <clears throat> uh, the 1984 election was the very first one that I voted in. Now I seem to recall that the so-called New Zealand party no. got like 20% of the vote in that election. 12 Was it 12? Okay, it was a little bit less. But that did sort of tip the balance. It was a protest vote against National, you could say, and Labour snuck in, as it were. Um, to what extent do you think that Labour didn't necessarily win that election on their own merits? And what influence <laughs> did the New Zealand party have, if any? It got rid of Maldoon, you were quite right about that, and um, and in retrospect, I think too, the New Zealand Party, which is, for the game, those of you who don't know, it was a proto-act party, led by Bob Jones, and so essentially it had, uh, what was it, uh, essentially free market economics, uh, basically user pays education, um, user pays healthcare, and it's an interesting question because in the end, of course, Douglas had pivoted themselves towards the New Zealand Party. And in fact, 
what came out later on uh, was essentially that Douglas had rushed around the finance houses and so on, in Wellington and so on, prior to the 84 election, in fact, 1983, starting in 1983, saying, well, look, Labour is standing for this, this is your policies, but look, just forget all that. This is what I intend to do. I intend to deregulate, I intend to float the dollar, I intend to do all these things, but you have to keep it quiet because this is what I intend to do. So I think in one sense, you know, the New Zealand Party actually highlighted the policies that Labour was about to implement. I seem to recall when um, uh, Bob Jones stood down, or rather um, he wasn't interested in running again, and he said, well, we've already achieved what we want to achieve, Labour's adopted all our policies. Yeah. It was like, like Thatcher saying Tony Blair was her greatest invention, yeah. Yeah. So when you said you went into coalition, Quentin, how many MPs did you have? We had 13. Was it 13? It was 13. So you, right, so you got 13 MPs. 13. They've all vanished without a trace. Except for the, what is it, Lila's still around? Lila Harry. Lila yeah. Harry. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Do you want to move into more general questions? It's, it's kind of getting that way anyway. Question from David. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I was just going to say also on the political context, the um, mass social movements played a big part in the times. Obviously the trade union movement was very strong um, in <coughs> 1991. Uh, and also there was the Springbok tour, um, which was primarily you know, protest directed against Muldoon. And then the anti-nuclear movement, which actually caused the Muldoon to cause a snap election. And I believe the New Zealand Party stood on a nuclear free platform too. So they were a haven for, you know, had two National Party MPs crossing the floor over the anti nuclear issue and voting with the Labour Party. And so there were a lot of National Party voters that had been won over to the anti nuclear cause. And so the New Zealand Party would have acted partly as a haven for them who couldn't bear to vote Labour. But it was quite remarkable because the mass anti war movement that grew out of end of World War II and the Vietnam War and all of those sorts of issues actually rolled a right-wing government and forced New Zealand to break its military alliance with the US. But the government, Labour was able to use that popular support as a cover to do all this economic stuff. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, essentially, I think in retrospect, Bob Jones had it right. When it came down to 1984, that election, there were only one thing that was important. And I remember this, you know, basically, as a thing, and you all remember. And that, and that person was, sorry, there was only one issue that was the deciding factor in 1984, and that issue was Maldoon. Yeah. You're either for him or you're against him. And, you know, essentially Maldoon made a big thing out of this fact about, <laughs> only you can trust me to run this, run this economy. And, you know, he had this wonderful ad, I remember, with him going through a fog-covered forest, sort of stumbling around. And you know, and the, and the person said, close your eyes and imagine a New Zealand without Sir Robert Maldoon. The problem was, is that millions of people did, and they could. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. And you know, the, the, the regrettable thing was that Labour simply lied. The Parliamentary Party lied. You know, I mean, it wasn't going to do any of these things. You know, but of course, no one knew about that until they actually, you know, until they got into power. The thing about Bob Jones, which you can't put personality aside from politics. Muldoon personality, he came across as a malignant moral dwarf, which is basically what he was. A little thug, if you like. Bob Jones, scion of the ruling class, you know, richest voices, still got the biggest building in Christchurch, well, it was his, he sold it for a fortune. Um, <clears throat> no capital gains tax. Uh, but people liked him for one reason. You might remember this. He was a great fly fisherman. He loved going fishing. And he was out fishing, remotely fishing. And a journalist wanted to interview him. Nobody much likes journalists. <laughs> I don't know if you're here, but it's true. Anyway, what does the journalist do? Does he tramp in there to try and snare Jones? No, no. He brings a bloody helicopter in. Money's no object to these buggers, right? Brings the helicopter down. Of course, all the fish run to him. I swim for miles. And vanish. Jones is furious. So he gets him. <laughs> and people loved him. Personality? 
is important in politics. Yes. That's one reason why Eddington had the success that he did. It's also the reason why eventually he failed. This one from Martin? Yeah, so, I mean, you said two things which really interest me. 33% and 13 MPs. Now, from my understanding of what you've just said, he then had a pretty hefty collapse very quickly. Why was that? Well, I think that... Wrong? Well, we had 33% before we were even formed, actually, from memory, and that was in 1992. I think that, you know, basically it was just sort of that hard road about once you'd actually formed a political movement, what actually happened after that, and you've got the policies and so on. And also, Labour uh, basically reinvigorated itself, uh, essentially. Helen Clark went from sounding and looking like Morticia Adams to actually someone who looked like they were actually a credible Prime Minister. Also, you had the rise of Winston Peters, because for a long time we were actually by ourselves. And in 1993, when Peters formed New Zealand first, he actually stumbled at the first hill. He actually, he actually approached us initially, and there was a lot of to and fro and we, basically Paul will remember this too, we weren't happy about having any sort of agreement with Winston. And neither, to be fair, was Jim. But there was this entire wrangle and so on with Peter's making a huge thing saying, well, I join the New Zealand, uh, join the Alliance, but if only if they get rid of these, you know, these socialists and people like that. And then of course he went to form his own party and said, Well, you know, the Alliance but what he didn't know was that McCartan had actually kept copies of all his transcripts and meeting notes and stuff, and then generously released them to the press in about a 20 page dossier which sunk Peters. But by 96, uh, essentially, Peters had recovered from that. And so, you know, he actually got more MPs. So I think he got 17 MPs in 96. And we got, as I said, 13. And also, I'll be honest too, we ran a fucking shit campaign in 1996. That was the only way to actually describe it. And in fact, so did Labour. Labour didn't do very well either in song in 1996. But Clark managed to actually rescue herself by actually standing, sounding like a winner, even if she wasn't. Jim didn't at all. And, you know, I, I think it was something that, again, you know, you can put down to experience or something like that, because um, in 1999, we ran a better campaign, but by that time, I think the gloss had well and truly come off the alliance. Well, as I said at the outset, Anderton was a mixed bag, like most of us, I suppose. He had his good points. He was not without courage, uh, but he had an authoritarian streak. And he had a history of personal association with Clark. And I think that as the Labour Party didn't retreat from the Rogernomics at all, hasn't to this day, in my view, but it has covered it up with a little bit more humanity on capitalism's ugly human face. Uh, and that was enough for Anderton. So the differences became blurred, and Anderson wasn't a left winger, never had been a left winger or a socialist. In fact, he was on record as saying he didn't leave the Labour Party, it left him. And that was true, yeah, actually. He was an old-fashioned Labour Party man. And uh, the times were no longer old-fashioned. That's a fact, too. What we wanted, Martin, was that essentially Jim wanted a nice 1970s-style bull-rolling Labour Party. And unfortunately, what we wanted was a modern left-wing democratic socialist party. And in the end, you know, essentially, the, yeah, it, it just didn't work in the same party. What questions from Tom then, Nick? Um, thanks so much for the, for the talk so far, guys. Uh, I am curious, you've talked about when you joined the party, um, New Labour, respectively, and I was curious, um, when you left Alliance and why? Well, I didn't actually, well, I did leave it eventually. It was down to about five people in Christchurch. Um, <laughs> It withered away on the vine. 
um, because people did leave. They couldn't see it going anywhere. They were quite right. And I suffered from inertia because this crowd didn't exist. There was nowhere else to go. If you're a political animal, what the bloody hell can you do? Um, one of the things that... It's a bit overly... We've had several references to trade union activity. The trade union movement throughout the entirety of this period was divided. Um, there are, well, you can measure that by the number of trade union officials that ended up as Labour MPs. Uh, a lot of them have done that. Laughing Leanne Malaya Dalzell, for a classic example, uh, did time in the trade union room, the secretary of the Hotel, Hospital and Restaurant Workers Union, when there was such a lease. But a number of the major unions were complicit with the Roger Douglas move. They voted for GST, for example, and that union under a subsequent leadership, a bloke named Harding, who ended up working for the Police Association, uh, went that way. And one of the biggest unions, the Engineers Union, of course, was that we called it NCORP. Uh, because it behaved just like a corporate uh, and it absorbed smaller unions as they were beaten down. The large unions that were and still exist in the state sector, of course, were not affiliated to the Labour Party. Um, so but that's a fact that you need to bear in mind. It was true that a number of unions battled and supported and unionists as individuals. I can remember the bloke who was the sec, Andy Lee, his name was, Secretary of the uh, Woolen Workers Union when we actually had woolen factories uh, in Christchurch. He was staunchly in support of us. And when we split from the Labour Party, what did Andy say? Well, my union's affiliated with the Labour Party, I can't leave. Which was a spineless and cowardly uh, position to take because there were people around like Bill Anderson from the Socialist Unity Party whose Northern Drivers Union was affiliated to the Labour Party and didn't hold Bill back at all. Same applied to a number of others. So the trade union movement is a mixed bag, always was. And those who had, are or have been union officials will know that that's the case. They're just like any other group of human beings, there's the good, the bad, and the bloody indifferent. Um, yeah. Well, I suppose the first thing I'd say is that, um, before I get all negative, was um, essentially we did achieve quite a lot. And I think that, you know, essentially the Alliance, or rather the NLP, proved that you could actually build a broad-based left-wing party. And that it was actually possible, and it was actually possible to actually get those views and so on, and to get MPs elected into Parliament. And I still sincerely believe that there are people out there who believe in things like regulated economies, and progressive taxation, and free health care, and free education, and all these sort of social democratic things. I, I honestly do believe that. Um, but in terms of the alliance, why I left, in the end, I was just simply burnt out after about 12 years of essentially, well, actually, I joined the Labour Party, like I said, in 82. By about 2002, I just really kind of had enough. I'd spent my young adult life and so on doing nothing but politics, and I really wanted to live a life and I hadn't actually done that and so on for a long time. And so it was really sort of a case that essentially when I moved down here and became sort of semi-active with the Alliance and then I left and I come back, it was more the case, I think, of me sort of really needing some space between myself and politics. And I haven't really been actively engaged in court to, of course, I came along to this group and met Tom and so on like that, so yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> It's all your fault, Tom. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hey, yeah. Um, I always normally think in hypotheticals around that period, around what could have happened um, with the Longy government, um, if there would have been a way to manage the, the financial situation of the state without reverting to um, the Rogernomics that did get entailed and what could have happened, but probably to keep it more uh, topical, um, if New Zealand didn't pass MMP at the referendum, what do you think would have happened to the Alliance Party or the Labour Party and its um, trajectory? If it hadn't passed MMP. If it hadn't passed MMP, would there have been an Alliance Party? Well, maybe. Um, 
maybe the question really is who would have been in it? Um, frankly, those of us who came out, uh, came from the NLP, were sick to bloody death of uh, the structure that Anderton and those who agreed with him put in place. Effectively, castrated the uh, NLP, who were the, the bulk of the membership. Because in order for a, a policy to carry, all four parties had to agree to it. And that meant that those ratbag, scumbag, mongrel, swine had a bloody veto on us. So the alliance wouldn't have survived like that for much longer, in my view. If it was just the NLP, yes, it could have, I think. But it would have had to, um, it would have had to have some serious minders around Anderton to control his tendency to snuggle up to the Labour Party as he thought it was becoming again, and his tendency to uh, be a bit of an ideological bully, if you like. I don't want to be too unpleasant to the man because as a constituency MP, if people were in trouble or who had problems, he was enormously helpful and generous to them. Uh, but when it came to the political issues, he was a hard man. I, I, I tend to be a bit more generous though. Like Paul, I have my problems with Jim frequently. and um, But... I think that, you know, by and large, for example, in the policy debates in the alliance, I mean, the NLP used to do very, very well, you know, because we were the biggest tribe, so to speak. We were the biggest party, and we were the most organised party and so on in the alliance. And but I am mindful, <coughs> for example, there, there are two things I'm mindful of. One, in the NLP, we had three pages of how to get rid of errant MPs. And the reason that was because after we came from the Labour Party, of course, we were damn sure that none of our MPs were basically going to do what they had actually done in the Labour Party. So ironically, of course, if the NLP had existed and so on in 2002, Jim would have been expelled from the Labour Party, from the NLP. <laughs> but we didn't exist, so, you know, that, that was sort of moot. And I'm also mindful of so on too that at that famous Queen's Wharf conference in 89, um, there was a big debate and so on at the time about MMP. And Jim was actually opposed to MMP at the time. He actually thought that MMP was essentially undemocratic and that in fact, you know, it actually sub, uh, subjugated the will of the constituency. But the party, the NLP, had voted, or the new party had voted in favour of it. And Jim, to give him his due, grunted and groaned, but he actually went out there and then campaigned for MMP. So he would do these things and so on, in fact, you know, if you do it. And in terms of getting things through the alliance, as Paul said, it was just a fucking nightmare at times, but I, I, I do remember a wonderful regional conference, particularly one, two, and, you know, this is um, Jim Flynn, and I'm not going to do the voice, but Jim used to say to me, well, you know, you'd be not way. <laughs> you know, you need to be nice to the Democrats. And I remember this one, uh, this one policy debate where the Greens started talking about the need to have flat hierarchies, and uh, then the Democrats started talking about flat hierarchies, which are, of course, a contradiction, it's a flat hierarchy. But anyway, so I said, well, okay, fine, you know, yeah, we, we need to have this. And what we should really be looking at, you know, in terms of flat hierarchies, is I suppose, you know, having workers control and so on of industries. And so they got really excited about this. And then they started talking about Quentin's motion. And I hadn't actually passed motion. And someone said, well, do you want to pass motion? And I said, okay, fine. And I said, I moved that the Alliance supports concepts of workers and workers control of industries. And now the front table, which also consists of Sandra Lee and this guy Paul Pierce, were out there pissing themselves with laughter at this point. And the entire conference, the Democrats and the Greens and so on, voted for it. And then five seconds later, the penny dropped as to what they actually voted for. So you could actually get these things, but that was actually blocked, of course, if I recall, by the National, by the National Conference, by the National Council of the Alliance, which was a pity, but, you know. Entertainment clients. question from I was going to say, I might have been going for about an hour, so I might take any last burning questions, and then I might have a 
final question, although I feel like maybe my final question might have, at least for Clinton, just been answered, but we'll see. Um, so I'll take the question from online. Cool. This is from John Moore. Um, I'll shorten a little bit. Did the expulsion of the permanent revolution group uh, strengthen the right within the NLP and influence sort of the, the, the formation of the alliance and going into the Labour? No, they were regarded as nutters. And uh, it's a good written search on all sides. Didn't Sue Bradford resign in protest there? No, that wasn't over that. Oh, okay. Sue, 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 had, uh, Sue Bradford had uh, difficulties with, uh, uh, with Jim. And uh, she was, in fact, uh, she's a tough woman, but she was in tears with the one reason I saw her. Um, this could be somewhat of a good like, closing question. Uh, but I'm wondering how knowing about this history can help us into the future, um, not only as like as a group of us and how we situate and act ourselves, but also where we would put our votes. Um, so kind of inside and outside of the system. Million dollar oh. question. Come on, Paul, you can answer it. And do, do you think that the, the history itself can be a well, like, device and tool? History. As I said before, there are a number of uh, lessons to take from that. Um, most of them, of course, uh, lessons when you're close to the seats of power. And we're sort of quite away from yeah. that. But it does prove that in the right circumstances, you can form a viable left-wing group outside the traditional Labour Party. Um, that's a lesson. Another lesson, in my view, uh, and I've only just briefly alluded to it, is that politics has to be more than just electing people to represent you in Parliament or in the, the city council or wherever. Uh, it has to be something that involves people, uh, writ large, uh, not just a few individuals speaking on behalf of the people or the union. The union isn't the secretary and a couple of organisers and uh, uh, a few big mouths. The, the union has to be the rank and file. And all the determining issues have to be voted on by the rank and file. You don't say, right, we're, everybody's out. It doesn't work like that. People have to decide for themselves. But they have to be led as well. It's not a contradiction. Um, if I can be a little sectarian, um, I don't think the Russian Revolution would have succeeded without Lenin and Trotsky. I don't think the Cuban Revolution would have succeeded without uh, uh, Fidel and Che and, and others. There needs to be people that you can look at and say, you have the capacity to lead me because I trust you and the values you espouse and your proven efficiency, I have confidence in. Um, so yeah, those are lessons. Again, I come back to the New Zealand Post, or what, Kiwi Bank, yeah. uh, which was owned by New Zealand Post and is now being split up and is a bit owned by the Cullen uh, Fund and a bit owned by ACC, you know, whatever. But it's in the public domain. But it doesn't matter because it's part of the banking system that has to behave just like the big Australian owner uh, thieves that uh, run the other banks. Um, in fact, it was Kiwi Bank that led the charge to get rid of checks. Outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Bastards. <laughs> Bastards. Yeah. And the other banks tell lies about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I went to the... <laughs> you, went, you didn't anticipate this when you asked that question, did you? Yeah, yeah, hey, oh, oh, old man yells at cloud. <laughs> the Bank of New Zealand, ill-named though it is, was totally owned by uh, Australians. Uh, and has been bailed out by us taxpayers twice, okay? And complained that they wouldn't take my cheque anymore and I was going to pay something like that. And they lied to me. They said, oh, that wasn't us. That was the government. I said, that's a lie. It was the banks that did it. Oh, well, it was actually the Reserve Bank and that's owned and controlled by the government. That's another lie. 
It was set up to be independent of the government. So they tell their staff to lie to you. Back in New Zealand. <laughs> it was a good closing question, that. Yeah. <laughs> Nationalised a lot of the buggers. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. More checks and balances. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Quinches, do you want to add anything? Well, have, have another crack at an uplifting question. How, how can I follow up with that? Uh, uh, just, you know, right, sorry. Uh, uh, <laughs> I just wanted to make a slight digression and, and just start to point out that, in fact, Jim was expelled from caucus, from the Labour caucus, for actually opposing the sale of the BNZ, essentially because the Labour government actually um, sold the BNZ, and we had all these centre-left MPs who essentially went around wringing their hands saying, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do it, and then including people like Harry Dinehoven, Sonia Davies and so on like that, who then basically went into the house and voted for the sale. And, and they got rid of checks, those buggers. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. But in terms of your actual question, um, I mean, it's something I've been asking myself and so on too. There are certain things that I wouldn't do and so on now. Um, you know, for example, one of the big things that um, we certainly wouldn't do and so on in terms of, if you read one of the people's had the People Speak seminar, because quite frankly, you know, that was when we got basically the permanent revolutionary group and so on who first up there. But I think that the importance to me was that one, as Paul has said, you know, since you demonstrated you could actually get a party that believed in things, organise people and get people to vote for it. And that is incredibly powerful. And I think that there is a dichotomy, of course, about between what we want and what, uh, and what actually happens in terms of electoral politics, because electoral politics is machine politics, and we want something more than that. But at the same time, electoral politics is also incredibly powerful, that you know, essentially everything we take for granted here now is a result and so on of electoral politics, and a result really of industrial action and so on too. But I'm going to be honest here. I don't really think that the unions have actually achieved that much in the past 50 years, and essentially a lot of this is actually the, the result and so on of us basically having a political agenda and putting it forward. But I think the important thing is to actually keep in touch with your membership, to carry them along with them, and to make sure that the organisation, and originally the NLP, was actually very democratic. We had something called policy commissions that weren't hierarchical, that were actually uh, basically vertical, and essentially anyone could join as many policy committees. Yeah, horizontal. <laughs> God, now I'm doing it. And, um, but, you know, but what it meant was um, essentially that anyone could actually join and participate in these horizontal committees. And, um, and, and you know, it, it allowed us to actually keep in touch and so on with the grassroots and so on with the membership that fell out. The alliance was a lot more top down because of this structure, because we're dealing with five separate parties. And you know, in terms of the alliance itself, I remember writing at the time that really the alliance should have been basically uh, the big mistake in my mind was actually allowing alliance members. And essentially, because what would happen is you had the five members parties, and you could join any of the five parties. We had these group of people saying, "Oh, we don't want to do that. We want to support the alliance." And the moment, of course, you join the alliance, then essentially they said, well, we need to have input and so on into the alliance. And so up to that point, there hadn't been anything like the alliance. The alliance was just an electoral grouping. But after that, it became a, a structured grouping. And you know, so alliance members were there, and the parties lost more and more power. And so my aim now would be, you know, essentially, if you're going to do that, it would need to be a purely electoral group. Sorry, I called last questions. I'm gonna but open it up to yeah, yeah, to talk amongst yourselves. It's it's been over an hour, so we can um, stretch our legs, refresh our glasses, and I'm sure that both Quentin and Paul will be more than happy to chat with anyone, field more questions, um, informally. But thank you very much for both of you.